quench the flames for a while, considering how best to explain it. The Rose is what we Templar draw our power from. It is a source of energy that we can connect ourselves with, and thereby do things we would otherwise not be capable of. It is a gift. To me, that just sounds like Dutch courage. Speaking of Dutch courage, it was amazing. I was drunk the last episode. No one seemed to notice. Quite fascinating. Energy, you mean like magic? Adelaide watches me curiously. I've heard that the country of Kaer has a very strict view on magic in the occult, even more so in the Tanvis. Only their priestesses are allowed to kind of magic, but it is very weak. Through small verses of prayer, they draw magic from objects called symbols and use them for different purposes. Gotcha. In the end, the views on these otherworldly things aren't so different in these two countries, just the degree of what is acceptable and not. No, no, not exactly. I'll tell you the story about the rose if you are interested. I'm not, but I'm Phil is going to tell me anyway. Go on, I need to pass the time anyway. Fuck it, there's nothing else happening in this novel. Just tell me something. I take another small pause to recall the old story before I begin, the way I heard it for the first time. I remember it clearly. It was years ago when I was still a little girl, looking like... Uh, fuck it, what the, does that I look like the Exorcist's shadow? It couldn't be any more creepy if it tried. I was still a little girl running down the hall, coming upon that tall statue. It was a beautifully shaped woman of stone, holding a rose in both hands, eyes closed. She looked both serene and beautiful as she stood in that hall, as if time didn't move around her. Who is that? My old caretaker said, smiled at my question. That is Lady Yvonne. She is the reason that the Templars of the Blue Rose even exist. The Templars? How so? Well, a very long time ago, there was a great war in Tanvis. Tanvis, whatever, Tanvis, they'll do. Lady Yvonne had lived peacefully in her lord's castle, far away from the front, but soon the war moved closer and closer to her home as Tanvis was losing the fight. And one day, that castle itself was under siege, overrun by enemy soldiers. The enemy was ruthless, destroying everything as they went. <laughs> Harsh. They get to the kitchen, they were just like, The cheese is evil! And they just cut it in half. It's like, that will teach it! Hmm. They even burned down the lady's beautiful rose garden. As all seemed to be lost, and many others, including the lord himself, has evacuated the castle, Yvonne still stayed behind along with a few other knights guarding her. She called those knights to her and prayed for them while holding the very last blue rose from the garden in her hands. As she prayed on this beautiful flower, the knights felt a renewed energy granted to them and they returned to the battlefield while Yvonne still sat and prayed. Suddenly the tides turned. <laughs> it did say these few knights, right? There were like five of them against the si- mm. Right. And these knights fought a brave battle with a power never seen before. The enemy was defeated and the last survivors fled. Those knights are said to be the ones that later form the Templars of the Blue Rose, and they still borrow the powers of the Rose whenever they go to battle. Why did she stay behind? I don't know, maybe she had strong faith from the beginning that she would be able to make it. Something will turn up. There's a very fine line between foolishness and bravery. That is definitely foolish. Looking up at that beautiful statue, I think she already became something of an idol to me at that moment. Lady Yvonne and her flower. That's it? In short, yes. Eh, doesn't really explain anything at all. Yeah, you're right, it doesn't. She furrows her brows in discontent and continues to stare into the bonfire. In short, Lady Yvonne's prayer still exists, protecting the nice fighting from her home. Those who train and pledge their loyalty to her will be able to form the connection with the Rose and make use of its powers. Then you can do that too, I take it. Of course, my lady, otherwise I wouldn't be a Templar. Hmm, I guess that's true. I swear in most games, temp fantasy Templars are there to kill people with magic. And in this, they just openly embrace it. In fact, they go to bed with magic, and... Mm, we won't go into that. I guess, for a moment I feel tempted to snap back at her, but instead I continue my explanation in an attempt to change the topic away from me. Well, in practice, we Templar make use of this connection to draw strength from the energies in nature around us. That's the gist of it. It sounds incredibly like a placebo, doesn't it? Oh, I have no power, my lord! You've jogged for five minutes. Feel the power of the rose! I feel renewed! You know, like... You could spit coffee on them for all he's gonna do. What about someone like me? Could a normal person learn me to do all that? That's a hard question to answer, milady. 
It takes much determination, training and discipline to be able to form the connection, which is a polite way of saying no. And when you finally make the attempt, then, according to the teachings, you will still only be able to do so if the Lady of One accepts you. Is that so? So anyone can do it. Is she even listening to me? Ah, it would be fun to try. Oh, yes, it would, wouldn't it? As if I'd ever get the chance. <laughs> she laughs and makes a bitter smile. I get the impression she's talking more to herself than me now and deduct that this conversation is over. Yep, I would draw the same conclusion. Leaving her alone, I lean my head back, staring up at the dark sky. Night falls and countless stars are glittering above us in the mountains. There is still a long way to go before we reach our goal. A very long day, apparently. The next morning, I dress in my own clothes and strap my sword to my, my side. <laughs> I want Tobias to say, no, I don't like weapons. And we're just like, ah, fuck it, it'll be fine. Tobias has prepared food for me in the kitchen. As always, he places the plates on the table as I enter and then leave the room without a word. The usual steaming cup of tea is there as well. This time, I remember to drink all of it as instructed by Heron. Ah, oh, fine. <sighs> now that Erin's told us to do all this stuff, we'll just do it without question. Then I head out again, still helped along by the crutch, but instead of going straight to the village, I go back in between the trees towards a small lake that I found close by. Is this really a good idea, considering what happened last time? Mm. The forest is peaceful and silent, at least it's time we have our sword. I sit back, I sit down with my back towards the large tree facing the lake before closing my eyes. The sword is placed on the ground in front of me, still in its sheath. And then, with a deep breath, I begin my meditation. It has been days since I last did this. I can feel how my entire body has fallen drastically out of shape, but it doesn't take much before I fall back into my old familiar rhythm. Rhythm? It's not how meditating works, isn't it? It's like being in a deep sleep, just not actually sleeping. Eh, what would I know? I can almost instantly feel the energies flowing around me in this forest, the slow movement of the water in the lake. This place is different. It's hard to say, but it almost feels more alive. I find myself mumbling this out loud, and it's really surprising how the natural energies here feel more tangible, more dynamic. This is a place of great spiritual power. Do the villagers know of this, I wonder? Normally the average human being wouldn't be able to sense these things, so probably not. I thought they were elf. I thought, like, Tobias was an elf. Probably not, I'm just being elfist. Then I suddenly feel a change in the air around me and a presence moving up close behind me. Without a moment's hesitation, my hand grabs the handle of my sword and draws it in a wide arc while I push myself and turn around. The edge of the sword stops me there, right before striking the neck of the person that I've never seen before. But the stranger doesn't move a muscle, I feel myself involuntary freeze for just a moment as my eyes meet his this close. Those eyes... There's something unsettling about them where they stare directly back into mine and the fact that they have the problem of, oh hang on, my eyebrows are over my hair. Oh hang on, my eye is over my hair. It's either a very, very peculiar specific cut of hair, which I'm not sure gravity quite applies with, or... Yeah, this guy's got to be magical for that to fucking be pulled off. I quickly bite my lip and regain my senses. All this happens in the course of just a few seconds. Hmm. We also have weird chanty music. It's a bad sign. Move and you're dead. So you noticed. The sound of his voice almost succeeds in making me falter again. Yet calm and cold, I narrow my eyes. Who are you? What are you trying to do? Sneaking up on me like this. The stranger draws back slightly from the sword while keeping his eyes on me. He doesn't seem the least bit intimidated as if what I do with my sword doesn't really matter to him. I was surprised you're still here. What? I had not expected to see you here, so I watched trying to figure you out. Is this guy like a tranquil? He has no sort of emotions at all. Anything he does isn't understa- isn't comprehended by other people. Clearly. Wait, what? What do you mean still here? I was sure you would have been dead by now, so when I saw you here I was truly surprised. And today you came back again. I don't believe my own ears as I stare back at this stranger. This person has been following me? Why would you think I would be dead? The dragon, of course. Why else? You're a bit weird, and I'm not sure I like the way that your t-shirt... They look like they've been stitched together like potato sacks. 
You're not to be trusted. You, you saw it happen? My eyes widen in surprise. I've never even heard Tobias mention anything about the attack, other than him finding me lying unconscious on the ground. I almost forget to keep my guard up. Yes. Then the others, what happened to the rest? I grab the handle of my sword even tighter and the tone of my voice involuntarily rises as I feel my heart beating faster. The rest? He turns his head slowly and looks away as if thinking deeply about this question. I'm not sure I was convinced that no human survived, so I simply left, but since you are here, it seems that I was wrong. I am impressed. So he didn't see anything after all. I feel my heart sink once more. I take a step back, but I'm still holding up my sword in order to keep the stranger away. Are you from the village too? The village? No, I'm not. No? Then where are you from? Now what, is he another hermit like Tobias? He's not a hermit like Tobias. Does he look like a hermit? Does he look like the person who runs around the village protecting the innocent? No! This is like the kind of shit you'd find in Final Destination. It's beginning to feel like this area is actually crawling with people. Or could he be another one from the outside like me? The man makes a vague gesture with his one hand, as if including the entire around us. Here. Here? Do you have a house up here outside the village? No, he just roams. No, the village, the forest, the mountain, this is where I live. So he's saying he lives in the village after all. What do you... Swoosh. There is a strong wind carrying leaves through the air between him and me with a soft rustling sound. The stranger turns his head and narrows his eyes. Watch out. Watch out? I thought that was you. I, I just assumed that you, the twist or something was going to be that you were dead. And you could just click your fingers and then fuck off somewhere. Is he going to protect me? I swing around at the sound of his voice and only barely see the shadow shooting towards me at high speed from the bushes. Using the power of my own movement, I swing my sword upwards to guard against it, but instantly feel a sharp pain shooting through my side as I do. I break down and miss my guard, resulting in the attacking creature crashing hard against my hand in the sword's hands. I fall down on one on my one knee, still grasping the sword tightly even though it was almost knocked out of my hand. The attacking creature falls back from the impact and I catch a glimpse of it as I look up. No we don't. <laughs> we still haven't seen the monster, don't shit me like that. My wound is still pounding after my rash dumped earlier, but I can't let my guard down. I'm about to try and get back up when the stranger from before suddenly glides in before me and confronts the monster. It doesn't seem armed though. Yes, magic. What are you doing? Without paying me any mind, he lifts one hand up in front of him, as if preparing to do something, and just stares down at the hissing creature. The monster makes a threatening lunge forward, as if wanting to strike, but the man doesn't move out of place before the hesitant foe. With another defiant hiss, the creature turns around and disappears into the forest. I stare in wonder at the scene in front of me. Using the sword as support, I get back on my feet. The, cl the crutch is lying on the ground, just out of reach. You should be careful in this area, that much should be obvious to you. The man turns around and looks at me again. I had it under control, if you have a problem then don't interfere. I <laughs> Why do all characters try and do this? Yeah, manly, proud, defiant. Look, you're almost killed. Pride shouldn't even come into it at this point. He casts a glance towards the trees that the creature had fled into. That one seemed to hold a grudge, I wonder why. A grudge? It was a mother. Could it, could it possibly have something to do with the small predator that I said flying with my crutch earlier? No, of course not. I mumble this to myself. Huh? He looks up again as if noticing something new. I too look around, trying to figure out what he spotted. Then suddenly he turns around and heads towards the trees himself. Hey, wait! But he doesn't stop. He disappears out of sight almost as quickly as he came. What was that about? Lena? The, uh, you sh fucking show up five minutes late, you bastard! Yes, and I'm just seeing that he's not an elf, YOLO. I, <laughs> you're a bit late to the party, Treacle. Cool. I was just attacked, and some man fucking died. Let's. Uh, are we even gonna ask him, or are we just gonna not mention it? Oh, I hope we ask him. I turn around and see a familiar face step into view. Tobias is holding his bow, he's probably in the middle of hunting. What are you doing? He walks over to pick up my crutch without waiting for an answer, then reaches it to me. I feel my anger level rising by the fact that I couldn't get time to pick it up myself before he appeared. 
What does it matter to you what I'm doing? You'll still hurt. You shouldn't be up here. There are monsters, you know. Yes, I know. I can take care of myself. Oh. I instinctively take one more look around after the trace of the stranger that I met, but he doesn't seem to be anywhere around anymore. I don't feel any traces of his presence either. Forget it. I'm done here. I'm heading to the village. Do what you want. I still have things to do. <laughs> All he's trying to do is help us. And we're just like, hell no. We should really be more kind to Tobias Christ. <sighs>